WNST, Taos and Baltimore, and WNST.net. All of our WNST coverage brought to you by our friends at LifeBridge Health Sports Medicine Institute. They're at Foundry Row in Owings Mills. Dr. Kevin Crutchfield joins us every other week, as does Dr. Craig Bennett. We talk about orthopedics and elbows and injuries and knees and blue tents and all sorts of things, including concussions. They do all of that in their place as well. If you're a weekend warrior, someone on the men trying to get healthier, or just want to get an evaluation of all of these things, you have a state-of-the-art facility right over at Owings Mills. World-class care in the suburbs, in Owings Mills. It's the LifeBridge Health Sports Medicine Institute. Also brought to you by our friends at Strategic Factory. Marketing, printing, promotional goods of all kinds, including the hat on my head, the mugs I drink from. But they put the strategy behind the signage, the printing, the branded apparel, to bring it home for you and help your business grow, because that's the whole point. Strategicfactory.com. This guy here, I uh, I don't know him. I've met him on the internet once, and uh, it came to me a few weeks ago through some fans of mine about a film made about the life of Mark Belanger, who was the first shortstop of the Orioles I knew in the early 70s, despite my last name being Aparicio. And all during my childhood, people from every walk of baseball life would compare one to the other. In the end, Aparicio is in the Hall of Fame. Mark Belanger is not in the Hall of Fame. There were some that would argue he had Hall of Fame skills with the glove, that the stick held him back, but he always hit the ball well at Yankee Stadium, as I remember it. Dom Dastily is a Golf Channel producer, a filmmaker, uh, who is, I think, from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I sort of famously knew Mark Belanger was from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, because I was one of those guys that looked at the back of bubblegum cards, and 30 years later, I'm still doing sports radio. Dom, good day to you in Orlando, Florida. I'm uh, assuming the weather's a little better there this winter than it is around here. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I don't know a lot about what you've done. I've seen the trailer, I've seen the film, and I knew Mark Belanger's mm. sons better than I knew Mark Belanger. Um, and I knew a lot about his work and the Players Association and all of that sort of stuff and collusion and all the parts that he was about baseball. I wish I had had more conversations with him. I didn't, but uh, here you are, and about to make a film to teach a lot of people a lot about Mark Belanger, apparently, huh? Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, you're right. I'm from I'm from Pittsfield, um, where Mark uh, went to high school um, and lived for a, a good bit of his life, um, and that was really the impetus to tell this film about Mark was, I'm a lot younger, um, obviously, I'm 36, but I heard quite a few stories growing up in Pittsfield and playing golf at Berkshire Hills Country Club where Mark's brother played. And I was always curious about Mark's story. And about three and a half years ago, I just kind of dove in headfirst and started working with Mark's brother, Al, um, and Mark's um, sons, Rob and Rich, who you mentioned. And for the last three and a half years, um, just through, through contributions, through donations of people who knew Mark um, and who loved Mark and knew his story, We've been traveling around the country, um, interviewing former teammates, uh, Jim Palmer, Brooks Robinson, Rick Dempsey, Boog Powell, Ken Singleton, Davey Johnson, um, some 30 people in total. And we just finished the film uh, about a month ago. It's 70 minutes long. We had a, a small screening party for his family and friends up in Pittsfield. And right now we're just in the, the stages where we're just trying to distribute it just so as many people as possible can watch it. Can I watch it right now and click away or pay a couple bucks? I mean, is it coming to a screening house in Baltimore? I mean, this would be the place where I would think you will find Mark Belanger fans. Um, I'm sure there are many and certainly lived here, uh, children grew up here. I have a uh, an audio tape that I tr not transcribed or I, I digitized uh, recently where Rob sat in with me. I used to do a, an annual rock and jock show back in the 90s. And, you know, Meatloaf would call in and Rick Nielsen from Chip Trick would call in and the guys from Sticks, JY. Would, so I would, you know, just do this thing. It was fun every year. For Getty Lee would call. I'm wearing my Getty Lee, uh, Major Lee baseball shirt right now uh, for, your, for your pleasure, Dom. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Rob was in Burst of Silence. They were a big band. 
them when I was chasing girls in the 90s, and I was 22, 23, 24, uh, and, and Rob was my age. I think he was a year younger than me, and we lost Rob recently as well. So, you know, I'm drawn to the story, and I'm drawn to your story. Tell me what you do. Let's start with you and, like, the background of all of this, because, you know, anybody that's tuning in knows who Mark Belanger is or was. I, I don't know that they know as much about his smoking or uh, the, 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 the strike and union negotiations and all the stuff that he was very, very passionate you know, every guy who's going to sign a $300 million deal, every Manny Machado and Bryce Harper owes a debt of gratitude to Mark Belanger because Mark Belanger lived for that, like, as far as I know. And I haven't seen the film, so you tell me, my man. Yeah, the, the, the side of Mark's story relating to the Players Association is, is definitely 100% true. Um, during, the, during the interviewing process, we talked to Dan Duquette, um, obviously Orioles general manager for the last few years, um, and he told me a story about an arbitration hearing, I think, that he had when Mark was in the room back when Dan was with the Expos in the 90s. And, and he, Dan swore to everything that you just said about Mark holding the line for the players and always being willing to put his foot on the line and say, look, this is what is best for the player. This is what the player's worth. This is what we're demanding. And to hear that from Dan, who could put himself in the room with Mark during an arbitration hearing, that to me was a story that resonated. And it kind of informed my whole point of view on Mark's story. And really, for, for folks who are interested in watching the film, it's available on BelangerFilm.com. So people can pre-order um, DVDs um, just for 10 bucks. Um, and really, sort of to your point about Mark and, and people who knew Mark as an Oriole, the theme that we tried to hit on was defense. Um, as an Oriole, eight gold gloves, um, he retired with the second highest fielding percentage among shortstops of all time, and currently today it's still in the top 40. I think his fielding percentage is 977. And I can't we, imagine him in the era of analytics where they told him where to stand, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know, you know what's <laughs> funny? There's a, there's a funny anecdote that Jim Palmer told us where a batter comes up in the 70s, and Palmer turns around and he tells Mark which way to move. And Mark stares at Palmer and doesn't move like Palmer was going to tell him which way to go. And Palmer throws, throws the pitch. The batter hits it right to where Mark was standing, right to where Mark knew where to be. And I think that just that perfectly demonstrates Mark's um, awareness of batter tendencies and how well he knew his position inside and out. Um, and defense was the theme that we struck on as an Oriole for Mark and his career playing in the big leagues. It was a theme we struck on with his position with the Players Association, and it was, it was obviously a theme that we struck on during his fight with cancer. And that, that theme of defense is, is um, pervasive throughout the entire film. When did this – look, I've written four books, right? So I'm kind of crazy too, right? When did this become something that was an idea – to something that really became a pet project where you're like, I'm going to do this. I'm not thinking about this. I, I guess that moment you jumped the shark in the last couple of years, and uh, we've lost Rob since then. Who you know, The storytellers around this, I mean, the 1983 Orioles got together a couple weeks ago, and I talked wow. to Richie Dower, who I know, uh, you know you talk to, and there's, uh, there, you know, all, most of the guys were there. Ripken wasn't there, but a bunch of the guys were there. Um, I had the last ever public conversation with Earl Weaver before he died. I didn't obviously didn't know it at the time, but in retrospect, I did. So, uh, you know, I, I have great affinity for all of that. I built my life around all of it. I mean, Mark Belanger spent 17 years here. Like, it's, it's kind of crazy how long he was here and what a part, the, you know, the, 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 two, the legacy that he touched in every way and then went on to work in baseball for two more decades, which was, uh, you know, I would say the most significant stuff he did was off the field afterward that no one saw. Yeah, and that, that's something that we, we dedicated the, the last three segments of the film to, was his work with the Players Association. And there's a, there's a funny photograph of Mark that we used in the film after the 94 strike ended, and at the time it was the longest professional sports work stoppage in North American sports history. There's a photo of Mark at a party after the strike ended, and he's holding up a shirt, and it's a, it's a baseball glove, below a caption that says, thanks for a fabulous 1994 season, and the middle finger in the glove is extended up, and Mark just has the biggest smile on his face, just knowing what they went through with Don Fear and Steve Rogers and the Players Association to, to hold the line and to not 
to not cave into a salary cap in baseball. Well, it was a story of his life, right? I mean, he came up as a kid. He saw guys get squeezed out. He saw guys, you know, lose their opportunity to make money. He lived through Andy Messersmith and all the Lords of the Realm. I'm sure he was one of the informants in Lords of the Realm. There was a whole section about him in Lords of the Realm. Him and DeSensei's and, you know, a whole bunch of Oriole guys were very involved in that. And, you know, Brooks was sort of vigilant about that after he was off the field as well that anyone who lived through that period where the team was torn apart in the 70s and the Yankees had money and they and they still have never fixed it as a sport, right? As a sport, it's still ass sideways, quite frankly, because you, you, you can't make a fair game this way. But the players were the tough guys. The players in 81 forced the strike in 94 and that's why Manny Machado is getting 30 million dollars and they don't get pushed around the way they have in the NFL Players Association as an example but all Belanger knew was sort of wartime when it came to negotiating with baseball owners yeah and there's a there's a good story to your point about Mark's willingness to speak up and um, defend other players obviously you're familiar with the the Kurt Flood situation where he refused to trade and challenged the reserve clause um, in the late 60s and early 70s. I'm familiar with that. I bring it up every week when Kaepernick doesn't get signed around here. <laughs> yeah, so he obviously Flood um, got, got blackballed, um, and Mark was one of the few players who publicly spoke up in support of Flood, and we, we addressed that in the film. And, and Steve Rogers, all-star pitcher for the Expos back in the day, who works for the Players Association now, he said that when Mark spoke up in support of Flood, that he put his job on the line. And this was this was before Mark had had truly established himself. Hey, man! All you need to know about years. that this is 1969, 1970, man. We're you know we're we're in a different way, right? Like Colin Kaepernick, anybody that takes his side, what hap- what's happened to them the last two years, right? Right. They, they found right. themselves without jobs as well. So to to think that it was any better or safer um, for him to do it. And a lot of that was race-related, as I still read it 50 years later with Kurt Flood. But to have Belanger and be a, a guy on the other side taking your side, that, that was, um, that's a ballsy stance to make in those days. They traded guys for less than that. You know, I mean, Steve Carlton got traded for being uppity, as I remember. Yeah, and at that point, player salaries were nowhere near what they are today. And Mark mentioned during the film that in his first year with the Orioles, he made $5,500. And I'm sure you've heard the stories where up until 1978, each winter, Mark would go back to Pittsfield and work at Bessie Clark, which was a a sports department store. And he would fit people for skis and he would fit children for shoes. And he made five, six dollars an hour just to help pay the bills and put food on the table for his wife and two young boys at home. Wow, I did not know that. I did not. I mean, so in 1976, 77, 78, those years when I'm out there buying a ticket with my pop and taking the bus, taking the 22. He, he was off-season working at a sporting goods store. Yeah, up in Pittsfield with his brother Al on North Street in Pittsfield, just wow. working, working during the winter just to, to get a little bit more supplemental income. Yeah, and that, I think that, that job that he had and the, the fight that he had for Kurt Flood, I think it, it, it motivated his decision later to work for the Players Association. And I just think that, that that theme of him defending his position was something that, that resonated throughout his entire life. Um, and just sort of on an unrelated note, you seem to sit by the Bessie Clark thing with him working there. One of the more interesting things that I, I researched about Mark, not knowing this going in, was in high school, he was one of the best basketball players in the country. Um, he played three years for Pittsfield High School. He was a, a guard, forward, do, do it all kind of player. He scored almost 1,500 points. Um, he averaged 24 and a half points his senior year in high school. His team won the Western Massachusetts title. Um, and in the New England tournament that year, he played against the team Hartford Public, who had a guard who was a second team All American. His name was Eddie Griffin. And in that game against Hartford Public, Mark scored 32 points. And Eddie Griffin also scored 32 points. And after the game, Hartford Public won. Eddie said that Mark was the best player that he ever played against. And during that senior season, Mark was recruited by Division One schools up and down the eastern seaboard. And he was leaning towards UConn, where his brother Al went. Um, 
his brother Al was a pitcher on the baseball team at UConn and was like an informal scout for the for the UConn basketball team. <laughs> Going back to possible NCAA violations with his <laughs> brother recruiting him to UConn. And this is a part of the story that I didn't know because people obviously saw that Mark signed with the Orioles out of high school in, in June of 1962. But in April of that year, Mark signed with UConn to play baseball and basketball. And there's different theories about why he did that. But ultimately, once he graduated high school, scouts at the time, from what I found, were allowed, once he graduated, to make formal offers. So when he graduated, within 10 days, he signed with the Orioles. Dom Dastily is our guest. He's made a film on Mark Belanger and the life of Mark Belanger at belangerfilm.com. You can learn more. Uh, you can also find it out on Twitter where uh, some folks threw me a line and said there's this movie being made about Mark Belanger. I'm like, I knew Mark Belanger. You know, I, I don't remember having, like, conversations with him ever. I remember being at Max's on Broadway one night for a show, and he was there, and I was there, and I said hello. Uh, but he wasn't the kind of guy that was going to drive over and sit in the studio and put his feet up and talk two hours of, you know, sports with me. He, did, he was a very directed guy, and I always saw him sort of in, in a very business setting in Players Association issues in the 90s when, you know... To, <laughs> Once again, it was always wartime, right? Like in the 90s, right? Like, I mean, after the strike in 94, everything about Peter Angelos, everything about George Steinbrenner and Donald Fear, I mean, it, it soaked up a lot of the oxygen in the room for baseball. And then the steroids came, you know, after the, after the strike. So um, th 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 there was just so much conversation around labor and how contentious it was and how no one... You know, everyone offended everyone, but nobody wanted to offend anybody. You know, Mark was very, very involved in all of that, so I never really got to know him much, but I would think during that period of time, there's a lot of people he fought for that would be talking to you and talking about what a fighter he was, right? Yeah, and, and during that time in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, every time a contract came up for negotiation between the owners and the Players Association, there, there was a strike. So you talk about wartime, and we interviewed Don Fear for the film, and, and, and he gave us a sense of what was at stake there. And he, he made it perfectly clear that of all the professional sports today, baseball has gone the longest period of time without a strike. It's been 20, 23 years now since that 94 strike um, came to a conclusion, and, and Don Fear was quick to point out Mark's involvement in keeping all of the players in check and making sure all of the players knew well before 94 to save their money and be prepared for a strike and be prepared to sit out and to speak with one voice. And I, I think Mark was um, a perfect person for those times, right? He was, he was fitted for the times, I think, to represent the players um, and, and to defend their position. Hey, did you find a lot of video of him talking about things passionately and openly? Um, you know, I, I know he did media, and he was always sort of around, uh, but I, I would think that his own words would be out there somewhere, right? Yeah, during the, during the early stages of the, the film, probably about three years ago, um, Mark's, Mark's second wife, he got, he got married later um, for a second time in the 90s. She sent me um, three or four tapes of Mark being interviewed, um, I think around 96 or 97. And, and he spoke for a good bit about most of his entire life. And that, that was a huge resource for me for the film and to, to use his actual words. And then just for, for research and for background and to get a sense, obviously just looking at him and, and hearing his voice and getting a sense for how passionately he spoke, um, about baseball and about his life and, and about the Players Association. So that was, that was a huge asset. The film is out. It's Belanger Film out on the web. You can find Dom Dastily uh, anywhere. The golf chat. In your real life, you do this with golfers, right? Kind of, sort of. Yeah, yeah. So I've been at Golf Channel in Florida for 13 years, and I work in the, the feature unit within the news department. And each, each major championship, Masters, U.S. Open, the Open, and the PGA, um, I'll produce two or three more short form stories, like four or five, six minute stories um, on different golfers and different stories. And part of the reason why I wanted to tell this story on Mark was it, it was an opportunity to really 
uh, dive deep into someone's story. Um, the film runs about 70 minutes. So we had, we didn't have a specific runtime to hit and we could kind of go as long as we felt the story needed. Um, and the more I kind of dug into Mark's story, um, the longer the, <laughs> the longer the film became. Well, you're going to find a lot of Mark Belanger fans in Baltimore who will want to check this film out and give it the 70 minutes it deserves. Uh, I have Mark Belanger's autograph on a baseball. I, I only have a handful of baseballs laying around here all the years I've covered baseball, but I do have a very distinct Mark Belanger autograph, uh, and I'm sure he signed it for me at 33rd Street and when I was a kid, and I'm sure somewhere I talked to him. I just don't have... The, I, I remember his son well, and um, and everybody here would remember Rob as well. Uh, Rob was a pretty magnanimous guy and a, a very charitable guy and a, a guy that did a lot of things. And uh, I know he would have been an incredible resource as well to tell some stories. But I'm glad you've told this story. I'm glad uh, one of my listeners turned me on to you and, and that you uh, made a little time. Dude, I don't know how anybody lives in Orlando who gets anything done without like going day drinking over at Epcot and playing hooky, man. <laughs> My wife does try to bring me over to Epcot to Disney as often as we can, and especially this time of year because it's, it's going to be 60 degrees today. It's, it's about perfect. Yeah. Wah, wah. I live here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, take care. It's great having you on, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you. You got it. Dom Dastily joining us here. The film is uh, on Mark Belanger, and it can all be found. Belanger is the film. Big league ball player, small town story. Belanger is an original documentary that explores the life of the late Mark Belanger, considered by many to be the greatest athlete in the history of Pittsfield, Massachusetts. It's directed by Dom Dastily, a Pittsfield native. Screening of the film was held in Pittsfield back on Saturday, November 10th at the Bolin Theater there. You can pre-order order a copy of the film by clicking on the DVD button, filling out the form at belangerfilm.com. And yes, I'm reading from the internet. And that's a great cartoon bird, 1976-77 version of Mark Belanger fielding a perfectly fielded ground ball with perfect form. Just like they showed me on the little, uh, the little what was things called? Tele Televiewer? What was it? Hold on. GAF, tele, whatever those things were. I had Rod Carew teaching me hitting. I should have told Rod Carew that when I had him on. Anybody have those Viewmasters anymore? Remember those? That's how I learned. Uh, my, my, my dad bought it for me to teach me baseball skills. I think he wrote it off on his taxes. Nasty at WNST.net finds me. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram, streaming live on our Facebook as well as our YouTube WNSTV channel. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, and WNST Taos in Baltimore. We never stop talking Baltimore sports.